Measure 91, it legalizes, taxes, and regulates marijuana for adult use. One ounce, you can buy one ounce at a time. I don't know all the fine details of it, but it's uh, no change in the law for people under 21. It's a felony to provide it to minors. Uh, it has all the protection to keep things away from children, and I'll talk about why that's important and how it does it. It's uh, going to have private marijuana-only stores that are licensed, inspected, and audited, not near schools. Colorado had something similar, and it's just been perfectly uh, uh, followed through, and it's, it, they're, they're very satisfied with how it can be regulated that way. Uh, strict DUI provisions, it'll raise, tax, it'll raise tens of millions of taxes earmarked for schools, local police, prevention, and treatment. Uh, there's a limited home grow allowed. Um, the thing to remember, which I learned in I-502, is these things are, you know, citizen initiatives, and we put it up and we vote for it, it becomes law. Then the legislator can tweak it over the years as it be uh, becomes apparent this could have been a little smarter, a little more of that, a little less of that. That's how the legislator works, and that's a very comforting thing. To me, I just want it to get uh, voted in, and then it, it can settle in and be fine-tuned. Uh, the status quo right now is, as I mentioned, 800,000 people a year arrested. 45% of all drug arrests are for marijuana. Oregon is 13,000 a year. Your pot arrests are up 50% in the last decade. It's not going down. Nearly 1,000 people in the last decade have been cited or arrested here. That's the population of Albany. And something that I think is very important to remember is 40,000 people have died in Mexico in their drug... In, in, in drug uh, turf wars and narcotic kind of things, and a lot of that. I think no country for old men is marijuana related. Now some people in Oregon are nervous, Oregon are nervous, they say why should we rush into this? You got 13,000 people dealing with the legal system every year, they're not rich people and white people, they're poor people and people of color that can't afford a record. These people then can't get a loan, they can't get their education, they can't get into school. Um, I think it's a, a huge expense. This is important for the United States that we have enough states to make this uh, critical mass so we don't turn back on this. And there's a track record now. Washington and Oregon are two years into this. We voted, more people in Washington and Colorado voted for our initiatives than people voted for Obama. I mean, it's no, it wasn't even close. And, uh, and right now, I think when we look back on it, there's been a lot of scare tactics about this is going to go wrong or that's going to go wrong. All in all, it's been very successful. And i got to admit, it was a leap of faith. Three years ago when we started doing this in Washington, we didn't know what was going to happen. Was the, were the feds going to bulldoze us? Was something else going to happen? But the Brookings Institute has done a study on this. There are no pushover. And they said, generally, none of the scare tactics have fallen through. Crime has gone down. Teen use has not gone up. There's been no noticeable change in DUIs. And revenue has gone up. You're able to take precious police resources away from petty drug uh, things and into serious crimes, and that's something that uh, Oregon sorely needs with limited law enforcement, is to let the police and law enforcement refocus on serious crimes and not be bogged down with marijuana-related problems. I know, for me, a big part of the issue is just taking money away from the black market and putting it into legitimate businesses and then taxing it. I was just sitting in, uh, with my, our governor, Jay Inslee, who really wasn't into this until he becomes one of the first mayors ever to have to deal with it. And he is so thankful that we arrest 5,000 fewer people a year. That saves money and it frees up his law enforcement officers. And he's so thankful for the tens of millions of dollars we're raising for Washington State. Now, when you hear complaints about these laws, most of them are assuming use will go up. I think that's a false assumption. Every country's track record, it seems counterintuitive, but every country's track record has been when you lighten up on the laws, use does not go up. There's no correlation between consumption and how strict the laws are. You'd think the Dutch would smoke a lot more than we do in the United States. It's been 25 years since they arrested a, a, a pot smoker. But by every country's analysis, ours and theirs, the Dutch smoke far less marijuana per capita than Americans do, and Dutch smoke less than the European average. Now, we've had, in Washington, we've had enough of a track record with our I-75. Ten years ago, we had I-75, which was exasperation. You couldn't break the federal law, so we had a law that said uh, enforcement of marijuana laws is the last priority for police. And that was kind of a funny little way to get around the law, because you couldn't go against the federal government at that time. 
Ten years later, they've assessed it, all the naysayers, all the skeptics, gunning for this thing, and it is clear. Teen use did not go up, there was not problems on the road, and it was a successful policy. So they've re-upped it, uh, or no, we've actually legalized it, so that's good. They've, uh, um, when you, uh, a lot of people just assume more, pe there's a reservoir of people waiting to ruin their lives as soon as marijuana becomes legal. <laughs> My feeling is people who want to smoke pot do. When you legalize it after this next election, there might be a little spike up and then it'll settle down. But I, from my perspective in Washington, it's just not a big deal anymore. You go to the Netherlands, and most people have never been into a coffee shop. Most people don't hardly know what the smell of marijuana is. It's for the musicians and the bohemians and the tourists down there, you know? It's just nice that it's down there, and, and, and people can do that if they want to. Um, there's uh, a lot of people are worried about the gateway effect of marijuana. A lot of people will acknowledge marijuana is not that big of a deal, but, you know, as soon as you start smoking pot, pretty soon you're going to be a heroin addict. My European friends have told me the only thing gateway about marijuana is when it's illegal, because the only place you can get it then is from a criminal on the street who's got a vested interest in selling you something more addictive and more profitable. Now, Portugal is an interesting case. Ten years ago, Portugal legalized the consumption of all drugs. All drugs, hard and soft. Why? Because they had a hard drug taking population problem. After you have a dictatorship like Salazar, as soon as the dictator's gone, you have this hedonistic fling, and they had a lot of hard drug needle addicts. So they had to do something radical. They, they legalized the consumption of all drugs, and 10 years later, that was with a, a liberal government. 10 years later, there's a conservative government. They, the people who originally were opposed to it, today, they've had a chance to decide if they wanted to re-up it or not. And the conservative government in power re-upped Portugal's Law 30. Because by every assessment, the law was a success. Little Portugal had 100,000 needle addicts 10 years ago, now 50,000. The threatened increase in marijuana use never happened. Marijuana consumption stayed the same. They didn't see the marijuana tourism they feared. And police now has been able to refocus on real crime, saving the country millions of dollars and dealing with real problems. That's why I think that people are overblowing this. As soon as we legalize, everybody's going to be taking it. No society has borne that out. A lot of people are concerned about children, wrongly assuming use will go up. Well, like I-502, Measure 91 protects all of the, the way for people under 21 that they are with the status quo. It changes nothing. You can't advertise it, it's got to be far from schools, and it's going to dedicate money to drug treatment and drug education, which I think is really important. It's hard to know all the details here, but it speaks volumes when you know that in Washington State two years ago, the Children's Alliance, over 100 groups that work on children's issues, endorsed I-502. Because they know that the laws against marijuana are the most dangerous and family interrupting aspects about the drug problem. The most dangerous thing about marijuana is the fact that your kid can get busted with it, and then they can't get into the college they want to, and so on. That's why the Children's Alliance endorsed I-502. Some people say, it's the wrong message. If you're going to legalize it and let adults consume it, what are you telling the kids? You're telling the kids what any good parent tells them. This is for adults, it's not for kids. Someday you can make the choice. It's like this cocktail. No, you can't drink the cocktail. You can't use my car. Wait till you get older and ask me again. You see, that's parenting. It's not the wrong message. Um, <laughs> You know, a lot of us have raised kids. My wife and I had a, a very uh, 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 thoughtful time trying to get our kids through their teenage years, and I wanted to be credible. And if you just parrot all the reefer madness propaganda, you lose all credibility. I know what it was like for teachers in our district to have the D.A.R.E. program there, and they couldn't say what they really believed about this. And consequently, the teenagers won't listen to anybody when it comes to teaching them the dangers of hard drugs. And I think credibility for teachers, parents, and cops is really important when you consider the risk of hard drug addiction for young Americans. A lot of people um, uh, know who are in this business that the best way to lose control of a dangerous subject substance is to make it illegal. The best way to control it is to uh, regulate it and, and educate people. Uh, consider how teen use of cigarette smoking has gone down by 50% in, in recent years because we have regulated and educated people. I think we can do that with marijuana smartly. By the way, when some people say, look at how many young people are in treatment these days. 
So it's not an honest argument because kids who are arrested for pot just because they've got it in their pocket are sent to the judge and they give a and they get an option to have this serious sort of a problem or go to treatment and they'll just choose the treatment. A lot of people say, yeah, but you know, it's laced with all sorts of dangerous drugs or laced with dangerous substance. You don't know what's in the marijuana. That's an argument for voting for Amnesia 91. Because when something's illegal, there's no way to uh, check it out. I mean, thousands and thousands of Americans died during the prohibition against alcohol because they're selling moonshine. People don't die from bad booze now uh, in the moonshine kind of way. Uh, and the same thing would happen when marijuana is uh, regulated. It'll be packaged and labeled very carefully and uh, people will be keeping an eye on it. People are concerned, won't the feds just come in and preempt things? And that was a big concern when Washington and Colorado were working on this two years ago. The federal government would just trump all what the state, the, pop, the popular opinion of the state, and just uh, impose their uh, insistence on keeping marijuana illegal. Um, I worked very closely on this with our governor, and he went to meet with Eric Holder. And what Holder said was, you've got to keep it away from kids, you've got to have a consistent law that is enforced consistently, and we don't want leakage into, they call it leakage, into other states. You know, that, that was their main concern is, you know, if it's legal in Washington, all of a sudden, everybody in Portland and, and, and Idaho will be uh, uh, getting it, you know. Uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, important to remember on this that our government does recognize that states are incubators of change. If there's a federal law that needs to be reconsidered, the federal government is not likely to say, oh, we were wrong, let's drop it. It takes states one at a time to challenge that federal law. That's how they brought down the uh, prohibition against alcohol back in the 1930s. The government didn't say, oh, this law is causing more problems than the drug it's intended to fight. It was New York that finally said, we're going to do it what we think is much smarter. We're going to allow beer drinking. It wasn't alcohol. It was incremental. First beer, and then other states, and then hard liquor, and then home brew of beer. You know, but it was incremental, and pretty soon the federal government sees the writing on the wall, and they go with it. And to this day, there are states, or there are counties that remain dry because of the prohibition, which is fine. But state by state, now we're going to take down the uh, prohibition of our age. When you hear people talking against Pro, uh, Measure 91, you've got to understand what motivates them. Who are they? Why are they passionate about this enough to spend their time telling you we should continue locking up pot smokers? Now maybe they really believe it. But my hunch, my strong suspicion, and I, this is borne out by my experience two years ago in Washington and by talking with a lot of people working on this issue all over the country is, there's something I call the PPP, Pot Prohibition Profiteers. These are the people that speak out against any of these legalized tax and regulate marijuana laws. Pot prohibition profiteers, people who make money off of the fact that marijuana is illegal. And there's a lot of people making a lot of money because this is illegal. They're making it on both sides. They're making it selling medical marijuana, they're making it selling illegal marijuana, and they're making it uh, in law enforcement and prisons for profit and pharmaceuticals and, and treatment centers and all of this sort of thing. So if somebody comes into this state and speaks against Measure 91, as I know people are, ask them who paid for their plane ticket. Who paid for your plane ticket to come to the state and tell me how to, how to manage our drug problems? And it is a pharmaceutical company that paid for their plane ticket. Yeah. When I was working on 502 two years ago in Washington State, there was people to our left. People that wanted marijuana to be free as can be, you know. And they were upset because our law was so conservative and, and, and public safety oriented. In this state, I think the main opposition is people from the right that are coming, and these are people that are making a lot of money because of the status quo. So understand, understand, pharmaceuticals are threatened by this, police organizations are threatened by this, they get grants determined by how many people they lock up. Prisons for profit are threatened by this, sheriff's unions are threatened by this, a lot of sheriff uh, uh, police stations and so on, they can take people, they can seize people's property. And that, believe it or not, is a major source of revenue for a lot of police stations. So, understand what's going on behind the scene that way. Now, reasons to favor 91. I'm really into the racial justice dimension of this. Again, it's not rich white guys that are arrested. One of the reasons I really got engaged in this, because I made friends with a guy who was Bill Karolikowski's right-hand man five or six years ago up in Seattle. Karolikowski sent him to follow me and hear what I was saying when I was giving my lecture, so he knew my lecture better than I did. 
And um, he's a, he was a very nice guy. We're good friends now. And I, I visited him several times. And he just is really in this law enforcement frame of mind, you know. And once we had dinner, we were just walking out after dinner. And, and he said, Rick, why? I'm just, why are you so into this yourself? You're a rich white guy here in Edmonds. You can smoke for the rest of your life and, and never have any problem. You can invite your friends over. Just a little discretion. You'll be fine. You know that. And I said, that's why I'm into this. We're locking up. We're arresting 800,000 people a year in this country. 80,000 Americans are in jail right now. 80,000 because of marijuana laws. And they are poor people and they're people of color. And that is a huge cost to our society. Not right now. I mean, it's a huge cost right now, but it's a greater cost later. This breaks up families. These people can't get jobs. They can't get loans. They can't get into school. That's a huge cost. That's the new Jim Crow. The NAACP. You know, um, black communities have really been hurt by drug abuse. They're predisposed to be hard on drugs. The NAACP would know what's good for black communities better than anybody else. The NAACP endorsed Proposition, what was it, 19 down in California four years ago? Uh, they endorsed it, and they endorsed I-502 because the people that care most about what's good for black communities understand that the most destructive thing about marijuana is the fact that it is illegal. I've never been hugged by so many big black Baptist pastors in my life. <laughs> As when I went on my lecture tour around Washington to all these churches and so on, and I learned how excited they are to get this racist law off of their backs because it is a tragedy in our country. Fiscal responsibility is another thing. I mean, think of the black market, think of the underground economy that is stoked by the illegality of marijuana. Marijuana rivaled apples as the biggest cash crop in Washington state. Wow. And that's a big crop. And all of that money was going to gangs and organized crime. And now it's taken away from organized crime. It's becoming legitimate and heavily taxed businesses. And all that money that was going to be empowering organized crime is now becoming revenue that funds education, treatment, and law enforcement, and so on. That is a beautiful thing. The projected tax revenue in Washington is about $100 million a year. In Oregon, it's going to be less because you guys have a smaller tax rate on it, so your price will be closer to the street value, so there'll be less challenge of a, having a black market competing with the legal market. But it'll still be tens of millions of dollars, not to mention the money saved in law enforcement by allowing Oregon to redirect its priorities and free up its law enforcement officers to deal with real crime. Washington, as I mentioned, made 5,000 fewer arrests. Uh, Pete Holmes, my friend, the city attorney of Seattle, when he ran for city attorney, we were considering buying a $200 million prison. We needed a new prison in Seattle. He was running for city attorney, and he said, I have a good way to figure out this prison problem that we cannot afford. When I'm the city attorney in Seattle, we will simply stop arresting pot smokers and not build the $200 million prison. <laughs> Seattleites are not dumb. They thought, you know, that makes a lot of sense. We voted for Pete. He's our city attorney, and we never built that prison. We saved $200 million right there, not to mention, with the success of 502, having the burden of arresting all those people off of our cases. We can learn from history about this, and I've looked back at Prohibition a lot to learn from that. There's so many parallels. Back in the 1930s, Mayor LaGuardia in New York said, when a society has a law in the books that it does not intend to enforce consistently and across the board, the very existence of that law erodes respect for law enforcement in general. This is our marijuana laws today. They are a joke. They erode respect for law enforcement in general. And to me, that's a big, subtle, intangible cost of this misguided war on marijuana. Another issue to vote 491, Measure 91, is simply the civil liberties issue. My friend, the police sergeant who was tailing me for Gil Karolakowski, listened to my lecture once, and he said, I don't agree with anything you said except for the civil liberties argument. And that's the one he said I couldn't refute. It makes no sense at all, if you're an American, not to be able to, you know, enjoy the responsible private well use of something at home. And I believe this is an important part of the equation. I'm a hard-working, church-going, kid-raising, tax-paying American citizen. And I work hard all day long, when I go home, smoke a joint, and just look at the fireplace for three hours, that's my <laughs> civil liberty. I am concerned about the international situation. 
And uh, the United States has made a law in the United Nations and has pressured all the other countries to sign it. And this law requires all of these countries to, in unison, wage trade sanctions against any individual country that dares to legalize marijuana and treat it as a health problem and an education challenge and recognize the civil liberties of adults to use it. And that's embarrassing to me. And I didn't believe this at first. But then when I was in, did I, did I, I think I told you about this already. Um, I was in uh, Copenhagen, leaving Christiania. Christiania is this uh, hippie squatter settlement up in Copenhagen where a lot of people smoke pot. And uh, leaving Christiania, my friends say, be careful with your marijuana here because in Denmark we have to arrest a couple pot smokers every year in order to maintain favored trade status with the United <laughs> States of America. And I, I, it's so hard to believe, but that's the law. And that's what our country is all about, and nobody can question it. But now that two states going on four have broken that lock on this issue within our country, other countries are emboldened to get out of the no country for old men kind of cycle and get into the pragmatic harm reduction like Spain and Switzerland and Czech Republic and Netherlands cycle. Uruguay has legalized now, and America cannot really come down on it because Washington and Colorado have legalized also. So, election 2014, this is the time to make it happen here. It's, it's uh, it, you know, there's a cycle. In the 90s, Washington, Oregon, California, Alaska wanted legal pot, or medical marijuana. The federal government said no, politicians refused to act, so initiative process went into gear, and all those states got medical marijuana, and thank goodness they did, because medical marijuana has brought a lot of people a lot of uh, needed relief. 17 states now, or more than that I think, have followed suit and they have medical marijuana thanks to the boldness of those leading states in the 1990s. The same cycle is happening now. One generation later, in 2010, California tried but failed. They were not smart enough when it comes to assuring people about the issues of driving safety, children, uh, workplace protection, and so on. Uh, they were too loose. Uh, uh, and they failed. Uh, also, the federal government threatened that. And also, they were undercut from the, with the PPP, the pot prohibition profiteers on the left, and they didn't want it legalized because they're making too much money selling their uh, illegal pot. In 2012, Washington and Colorado learned from California, and we passed. We have smart laws protecting employers from having whatever standards they want in their workplace, keeping marijuana away from kids, making sure the roads are safe. In, night, in 2014, Oregon and Alaska are learning from Washington and Colorado. My friend Ethan Nadelman, who runs the Drug Policy Alliance, is the, he's the most important single leader in this issue as far as I'm concerned in the United States. He knows all of these things intimately, and he told me, Oregon, when we pass this, will have the gold standard in uh, smart, legislate, uh, legalize, uh, uh, tax and regulate laws. Oregon has a very, very smart law, a very mature law, a very public safety oriented law that will, I think, serve this city very well. When Oregon wins and Alaska wins, then in two years it's all eyes on California. And when that happens, we have, I think, reached a critical stage where we end the prohibition of our age. Five years from now, the country will Five years from now, the country will look back and be thankful for the boldness of people in Oregon to uh, step out and make this happen. So I've got just a couple more words to say, but I just want to open up for just a few minutes of Q&A, any comments or questions, anything I didn't make clear, and then we'll wrap things up. Yeah? Does this uh, measure say anything about hemp? Does this say anything about hemp? Industrial, industrial marijuana? I don't know. Peter? Yeah. Great. Uh, in the back there? Yes. So, uh, hmm. One thing at a time. She wants to legalize prostitution. Uh, <laughs> by, the way, by the way, I don't think this is... I, I'm sure there's some skeptics here, but in general I think there's a lot of people here that are just already with us. This is an off-year election. It, you know, last... You almost did it two years ago with with, with quite a, um, what other people considered a, a, too much of a loose law. 
you know, and uh, this is a much smarter law. This is a much more um, defensible law for people that want nothing to do with marijuana. They just want smart policy. Get your friends on board here. This is really important because it's an off here. When a presidential election is going on, it's much easier to do this. But we need to get Oregon on board now in order to get California in two years. Yeah. You know, the uh, retroactive, uh, you know, looking back at people who've been uh, suffered under the war against marijuana, it's a complicated issue and uh, I don't think it's necessarily uh, easy to fix. Do uh, you know anything about that, Peter? Uh, my understanding is, you know, when you, when you make it, when you change a law, it doesn't, the other people broke the law. It may have been a bad law, but they broke it. So you, you really can't, philosophically speaking, when, it, when a society changes its law, people broke the law until it was changed. I'm concerned about them, but frankly there's not much we can do right now, but I'm also concerned about 13,000 people who will be arrested in the next year in this state. The trend is up, not down, and uh, I think a lot of people should be up in arms about that. Yes? Yeah, we released some people, I understand, in Washington, but I know when we passed the law, the prosecutors just basically took thousands of, or, or hundreds of, of cases that were pending and just threw them out. And that was, that was our big celebration right there. Yeah. Well, you, if you have, a, if you have a, uh, an employer that says, my people cannot smoke pot, and he wants to test you, my understanding is he still has that right. So with alcohol, though, it's still, you can drink alcohol and it's different. Okay, that's what I'm Yeah, the problem with marijuana, from a testing point of view, is it can be in your system for weeks yeah. after you're sober. So how are they going to go about that? Um, uh, that's a tough issue, and that's, it's just incremental. But what I really want to do, frankly, is to get the law passed, yeah. and, uh, and that's, that's an injustice now, and it may be an injustice after the law is passed, but we can work on that. Once people realize the sky will not fall when we stop arresting pot smokers, you see. Um, yeah, question here. Yes, yeah. We have a problem with testing with DUI because it's not as easy as a breathalyzer on the road. If you are driving impaired, and I'm not a lawyer and I don't I haven't really had much of a, I'm not really smart on this, but my understanding is if you're driving impaired and the cop stops you and there's, he smells marijuana or whatever, he's got reason to think you might be high on marijuana. He can take you down and do a blood sample and then they can tell if you've got, uh, you know, marijuana in your bloodstream or, or, or uh, and uh, that's what, the problem is right now it's hard to, actually say how much. There's no way to quantify it yet, but one great thing about our law in Washington and your law in Oregon is money is earmarked for the study of that so they can come up with a smart way to measure impairment. Up until now they couldn't do it. I went to a pharmaceutical convention for medical marijuana up in Washington State. All day long they were talking about tests done on rats. And you can't interview a rat once you get really high. You know, it would be very easy to talk to anybody across the street, but they couldn't do it because it's illegal. That's the odd thing about marijuana. You can't test it on human beings, the way I understand it. But now, we can actually do that and learn something and then find a way to quantify what is uh, DUI when it comes to marijuana. Yeah? Does the measure include anything about labeling THC content? Um, does, does it include labeling THC content? You're going to, yeah, and that's going to evolve. Colorado and Washington are already realizing we've got, they, and they amend the law. There's no colorful, kid-friendly candies that are, you know, everything's got to be packaged in adult-proof wrappers. There's these kind of smart safeguards. You certainly wouldn't get one when, when it's an illegal substance, but now it's going to be uh, regulated. Yeah. Um, what is the distinction between the large corporate growing and smaller or, you know, What's the distinction? I think or, the thing I understand about Oregon's law, in Washington, you can't uh, produce it, distribute it, and sell it. It's got to be three different companies. 
Whereas here, you could be integrated vertically that way, and I don't know if there's a, a limit on the, on the size. I think it's, it's kind of free enterprise, you know. Uh, other countries would rather not have the big business like that, and they just allow, Spain just allows everybody to grow three or four plants at home, and they don't have that issue. America is free enterprise. And, uh, you know, it's just, that's a frustration for me because I'd rather have cottage industries, but the reality is there's going to be big industries coming in on that, and we just need to regulate it, like we do hard liquor. And I think we do that quite well on hard liquor. Uh, you know, you can't advertise it uh, uh, as aggressively as you can other things and so on. Yeah? What is your, do you have any comments on what happened with Washington due, due to the uh, production and just not being able to keep up with demand? Yeah, Washington, my understanding was kind of a fiasco. They had one uh, marijuana retail outlet in all of Seattle. Yeah. And they had, I think, two in, in uh, Chehalis, you know. Well, even, even down to the gross side, not to the district. Yeah, it's, I think it's clunky the way it's starting, and I just think that was doesn't surprise me. And over time, it'll get ironed out. It's just, you're unleashing something that's quite big and never been done. And I want to remind you, no other society has done this. The Netherlands, there's even a word for it. It's called the gray area. We just wink, wink, don't look at it, you know. And nobody knew how these coffee shops are getting all of their inventory. And uh, only now in the United States are we tackling this. And it's a, it's a great service, I think, to all sorts of societies with uh, complicated and convoluted laws. And you know, we're going to sort it out. It's not going to be graceful, but um, you know, people can people who, who want to make a lot of money in marijuana are complaining about this and that. Uh, I'm just thankful we're we're. we're not arresting all those people or freeing up law enforcement and this kind of thing, and we'll sort that out. Two more questions. Yeah. Yeah, so how do you feel about the somewhat political East West um, uh, across Oregon with, uh, you know, being Republican and Democrat? Okay, your state is divided like our yeah, state, I think, yeah. with more liberal people in the West and more right. conservative in the East. I can, I can talk all over Eastern Washington, and, um, and uh, I can frame this in a conservative way just as easily as a liberal way. To me, it's it's a common sense thing. There's fiscal responsibility, there's states' rights, there's civil liberty, there's credibility and respect for law enforcement. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons that you can talk to a conservative friend about this. Uh, one last question, yeah. Are we hard on drugs or are we soft on drugs? 
Right now, Oregon State has the opportunity to be smart about drugs, and to me, that's reason to vote yes on Major 91, okay? Thank you very much.